Uh, I'm Dr. Priyadarshini, uh, Assistant Professor at Dusmania General Hospital, uh, Hyderabad, and the Secretary for uh, Win India Telangana State Chapter. I'll be host, uh, your host for today's uh, webinar uh, uh, by Win India in collaboration with the International Federation of Kidney Foundation, World Kidney Alliance. And the topic uh, chosen for this uh, webinar is uh, palliative kidney care in um, uh, kidney disease. Uh, as we all know, palliative kidney care is an upcoming discipline in nephrology. Uh, so palliative kidney care basically deals with the stress and burden of the advanced kidney disease uh, through the provision of uh, advanced uh, uh, symptom management and uh, appropriate uh, caregiver support and also advanced care planning with the goals of optimizing quality of life, not only for the patients, but also for the families. So as with any other novice, there are certain barriers in access to the palliative care with respect to the work and the workforce, uh, and also with the respect to the access to the palliative care needs and uh, much resistance in the nephrology community to the palliative care and with the conception that or misconception that uh, palliative care is equal into end of life care. So the need of R is here. That is, uh, not only that we get access to the uh, palliative care needs, but the kidney care professionals should be equipped with the skills to address the palliative care needs of our end-stage renal disease patients. So with a short intro, uh, let's start uh, today's uh, webinar uh, with um, uh, today's webinar uh, with an introduction uh, to this joint webinar uh, by uh, Lata Kumaraswamy, uh, who is president IFKF World Kidney Alliance, managing trustee Tanker Foundation, and marketing director Quadra Press India Limited. So good afternoon, everybody, and good evening and good morning to others from all over the world. Uh, on behalf of the International Federation of Kidney Foundations, World Kidney Alliance, I welcome you to this uh, Win India joint webinar along with us. So a few words about uh, IFKFWKA. Uh, our foundation was established in the year 1999. And, they form, and we formed the World Kidney Alliance in 2020. This is an international body that fosters collaboration worldwide to improve health and well-being of kidney patients around the world. We lead a worldwide movement to promote better kidney health with primary, secondary, and tertiary preventive measures. We also pro uh, want to promote optimal treatment and care for patients so that we can maximize the health and quality of life of kidney failure people. So what is our vision? IFKWK's vision is better kidney health for all, all over the world. To lead a worldwide, move, worldwide movement to promote better kidney health and to help as many people as possible become aware of the disease, become aware of patient care, medication, and so many other uh, factors related to kidney disease. So we actually had a revival a few years ago because we were pretty big and then gradually over a period of time, it went down because we're a floating organization. And right now we're in Mexico with the head office being in Tanker Foundation in Chennai. And we run our office from here and run the website. So what do we want to do? We want to establish an international community and network for people uh, who want to know more about kidney disease, who want to set up foundations, who want to help more people, who want to, who want to exchange knowledge and ideas about kidney disease. We want to promote patient care, centered care, patient engagement, patient empowerment, because patients are the last people, you know, who kind of have a say in so many things. So it's very important that we also take the patient, the caregivers, the doctors and everybody involved. So we also want to promote research into kidney disease. So what are some of our activities? So the World Kidney Day is one of our activities along with the International Society of Nephrology. This was an idea of the IFKF WKAs and 16 years ago, we started it along with ISN and we run this every March. So we find that a lot of people, not only nephrologists, but people from all over the world affected by kidney disease join hands and World Kidney Day has become an, uh, you know, uh, an international movement. Of course, we are trying to make it uh, uh, WHO recognized and hopefully, you know, that should happen soon, but we have to make an effort, uh, you know, to make that happen. Uh, we also have a Connect magazine where all our members talk about all their activities and all the, what all the foundations do in our um, uh, IFKF WKA. We have a World Kidney Recipe. We want recipes from all over the world, which are kidney friendly. 
And that is very important because a lot of us don't know what to eat. And uh, it's it's such a, a struggle for people with kidney disease, even our post-transplant and on dialysis, it's such a, a challenge for them. So we are trying to help them through this World Kidney Day uh, recipes. We want to have more webinars. We want to do networking. We want global outreach. Right now, we have around 34 members. We need to grow. And uh, our website is www.ifkf.org. So we would really love it if all of you could follow us on our media handles, social media handles. Uh, now, a few words about WIN and our involvement. When I met Dr. Manjusha at the... Um, uh, Indian Society of Nephrology Southern Chapter Conference, I have never met somebody who was so willing to get involved and so willing to share and become part of IFKF WK. And so that was a really, uh, you know, we're really grateful to uh, your Women in Nephrology India team uh, and Dr. Manjusha and your whole team for spontaneously agreeing to join us. And we deeply appreciate that instead of asking what is in it for us, you actually said, what is it we can contribute towards webinars, towards knowledge? So I just wanted to tell you as president, I'm really, really grateful that uh, you have joined hands with us and you spontaneously agreed to help in this outreach program and webinars and towards the larger goal of kidney disease awareness all over the world, which is the most important thing. Uh, my grateful thanks to Kausi, our coordinator, to Dr. Georgie Abraham, who's constantly inspiring me. And I find he's an inspiration to a lot of the young nephrologists in this group also. And uh, he's been a person who's really pushing uh, and wanting us to do more uh, in the field of nephrology and awareness and uh, patient care and so much more. So I will finish now. Any more information, you can always call me and ask me and you can look up our website I just want to say our grateful thanks to Win India. Really, really grateful to all of you. Our esteemed panelists, I think each of you is a, a, a fantastic specialist in, of, in, in nephrology and other areas in your own right. So we're grateful that you're here with us today, our participants, and most of all, the tech team for putting this all together. So thank you and welcome you all. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be a fruitful uh, webinar and we are really going to learn a lot today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lata, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's really heartening to hear some great things being done by your uh, uh, foundation. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Urmila Anand, ma'am, who is uh, President of uh, Women in Nephrology India and uh, Head of the Department at Amrita Hospital, Faridabad, to say a few words. Good afternoon. And uh, madam, thank you very much for your kind words. and. As you said, Manjusha and the whole team of Women in Nephrology is very keen to work with IFKF. And I remember the group was much, much larger. And once upon a time, if I'm not right and wrong, it was also sort of part of Bangalore-based uh, activities used to happen also. But as of now, Women in Nephrology is just two years old and we have a lot of young girls Priya John, your uh, MC of today, Mistress of Ceremony or Master of Ceremony, as you would like to call her today, is one of our young nephrologists. And there are many who have curated this program, Divya Vajpayee, Shruti Dapiawala. And we have got many excellent speakers from various parts of the country for palliative care in nephrology, which I think is a very neglected part of our profession. And I'm really grateful that you have given us the opportunity to collaborate with you and to bring about such areas of uh, nephrology where we don't talk much about them. And as Manjusha would have told you, and she will tell you in the end also, that our World Kidney Day activities just don't start or end with World Kidney Day. The first year of our uh, organization, we had a seven-day meeting and we involved all stakeholders not just nephrologists or patients, but even technicians, nurses, and even young students to come and contribute to this concept of World Kidney Day. Last year, we had it for five days. And we hope, working with you next year, we would, as an organization, make a much more positive impact in spreading the awareness of kidney disease and its prevention. 
Thank you, madam. Thank you for the whole team. And as you said before, I would like to thank profusely the tech team that is part of a pharmaceutical company who always have been very close to us, have been supporting us every month and even extra webinars that we have. And actually for us to be at this level and to reach worldwide, our message and our mission is with the help of this tech team. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for cheering us and uh, thank you for being an inspiration. We now move on to the uh, next session, uh, introduction to the renal supportive care. Uh, for this, uh, may I now invite Dr. Shruti Tapiawala, who is consultant nephrologist and multi-organ transplant physician at uh, Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai, and Global Hospitals, Mumbai. She's also the director of ATDI Lab Private Limited at uh, Precision Transplant, Mumbai. She's also honorary secretary for Ryerson West Zone Chapter and joint secretary for Women in Nephrology, India. And she uh, leads the transplant immunology workforce for ISOT. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, a warm uh, hello from uh, Wayne, India and IFKF. And uh, this is a very exciting webinar which we uh, jointly have curated, I should say. Uh, I will just set the ball rolling by giving the pointers towards what is going to be our points of discussion and how we want to give holistic care to all our patients. We all know that there is increasing numbers of patients with advanced chronic kidney disease who are older, frail and have multiple morbidities and they have a poor functional status. Furthermore, the patients with advanced CKD with or without dialysis have a very high burden of symptoms and have a poor quality of life. Since 20% of the population constitute of this kind of patients and they would want to withdraw from dialysis prior to death, increasingly older frail patients with ESKD and stage kidney disease are choosing not to start dialysis when it is recognized that dialysis may be difficult or may not benefit may be potentially harmful to them. More and more nephrologists would have to be trained for palliative care to give a holistic care to these patients. We cannot tell patients that we will not be able to do anything, but we have to say we will help. The webinar today is curated to review the principles and delivery of palliative care for patients with advanced CKD with particular attention to care of patients who want to withdraw from dialysis and choose conservative kidney care. The principles which will be addressed will be symptom burden, advanced life uh, care planning. It will also deal with the aspects as to how to withdraw the care if already started. The discussion is based on a case which experts from all around the country will discuss with us and this will lead us in turn to understanding how we can help our patient to the best. And with that short introduction, I would like to hand over to Ms. Priya, Dr. Priya, who can now take the proceedings ahead with the case and have the first speaker deliberate. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so now uh, we have an interesting uh, case here that is a elderly man uh, uh, doesn't want dialysis here. So how do we approach this? So to moderate the session, may I now invite um, Dr. Udmila Anand, the professor head at Amrita Hospitals Faridabad, Dr. Arpita Roy, who is newly minted ISOT president and uh, professor head of the department at the Institute of uh, Postgraduate Medical Education and Research at the SSKM Hospital, Kolkata. Dr. Manjusha Yadla, who is professor head department of nephrology at uh, Gandhi Medical College, and uh, Deputy Chair, uh, ISN uh, Social Media Committee. Dr. Swanilata, who is a Professor Head at Nizam Institute of Medical uh, Sciences, Hyderabad, and in charge Jeevan Dan Disease Donor Transplant Program in the Government of Telangana. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Priya. I think uh, Dr. Urmila is not, not there. Madam is there. Madam has said that she is a little occupied with the work. So I'll take this opportunity to uh, introduce the speaker, the first speaker of today's session. Uh, Dr. Nandini, she's going to speak to us on a hypothetical case scenario for 82-year-old Mr. S, who has ESKT. He needs hemodialysis, but he does not want dialysis. How to approach this? So to speak over this, 
uh, an ambiguity about how to go about this particular patient. We have Dr. Nandini with us. Dr. Nandini, she is professor and head of the department, Department of Pain and Palliative Medicine at St. John's Medical College, Bangalore. And I'm sure she's very vibrant and uh, she's going to empower us on this entity of palliative care, which is not very naive to the audience of nephrologists. But nevertheless, we need to know about it in more details and in depth, and we need to empower ourselves because it's a topic of concern and need of the hour. Over to Dr. Nandini for the presentation. Can you put it in slideshow mode, Dr. Nandini? Yes, yeah. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, for the opportunity of being here. And congratulations to the um, IFK as well as women, uh, women in uh, nephrology for choosing this topic. And where else will it come from other than uh, women in nephrology? So I'm truly grateful for having this topic being discussed across the meeting today. So I have been given the task of approaching decision-making in an elderly ESKD patient. And uh, uh, I just uh, I will just begin with that right now. And so this 82-year-old, uh, uh, Mr. S has um, end-stage kidney disease. He needs dialysis, but he does not want it. So let us see how we will approach this patient today. So first of all, uh, we only know that from this statement, we only know that he probably has some parameters suggestive of VSKD and he may have some symptoms related to it, but we don't know the details. So the first approach that uh, you know we need to do is move a little further, I mean, a little outside of the kidney and see who is this 82-year-old Mr. S. I'm just giving a name to him. Uh, Mr. Sahadev, I'm sorry I changed the age uh, by mistake. So he is an optimized uh, diabetic of 17 years and hypertensive. And he was detected to have CKD about three and a half years ago. And he has got coronary vascular disease, which is also being uh, treated. And he has developed swelling recently uh, over the six months. And now he has started feeling breathless. His symptoms have been getting worse despite adhering to medication, diet, and the monitoring that the nephrologist had prescribed. And he visits uh, the doctor uh, because he's very anxious because of the breathlessness, uh, which is happening with minimal exertion. His labs are uh, something which can be expected of a patient uh, in the late stage of CKD. And EGFR is now less than 10. And uh, this will be the time that... Uh, Usually, the nephrologist will recommend dialysis, and probably that has happened. And he says, uh, his doctor explains that he would need to initiate the hemodialysis soon uh, if his symptoms don't resolve with the initial therapy. And although he's covered, I want to eliminate that possibility that he can't afford because we are discussing all the medical scenarios. So, we are looking at this patient. Uh, I'm assuming that this patient has, you know, support and his children are uh, well off and they are willing to. Uh, but he is unwilling to initiate dialysis, but he lives with his wife who is keen to pursue the dialysis option just as a possibility for discussion. Okay, so this is the scenario. So we try to understand the person who has the ESKD also uh, to make the decisions. Now, um, sorry, this has been done. So we will, uh, so what, we, uh, what do you think what would be the next step which can be discussed? So, um, uh, what is the least useful next step uh, for that uh, that the doctor may proceed with? Look, Sahadev, maybe I wasn't clear. Let me explain the complications and distresses going forward. Uh, or, or that these are the statistics of survival with and without dialysis. See how you will benefit. So, you know, giving complete autonomy. Third is Sahadev, in that case, there is nothing more I can offer. And uh, or... A dialysis is going to definitely make you feel better. Eventually, we will go ahead with kidney transplant and that will be the long-term solution and dialysis may be a bridge. So these are the different options given. Usually, kidney transplant is not given to a person who of the same, but I'm just saying different possible responses that may be possible. But the least responsive will be, you know, kind of uh, there is nothing more that we can do, we can offer you because as a nephrologist, if we say that, you know, there is absolutely no person that this person, uh, this uh, Sahadev can reach up to because he's still symptomatic. He's still symptomatic because of his kidney issue. So there is nothing more I can offer, maybe kind of a ethical aspect of abandonment, which we don't practice. 
So now empowering the uh, autonomy. So generally there is this framework that is commonly used. So we look into different sectors. What are the clinical prospects and prognosis is one aspect. One is uh, quality of life, then patient family preferences and the contextual factors. So in the next few slides, I hope to bring some clarity. Now we'll begin with the clinical prospects and prognosis. So clinical prospects is generally done through estimating the prognosis of an 82-year-old uh, with whatever this, you know, background comorbidities and uh, how will he do with dialysis. Then establish the benefit as well as the burden. And then also look for, are there any guidelines that will help us, um, help, uh, help us make uh, some kind of decision which are absolutely you know ethical and valid and uh, the appropriate proportionate decisions okay so we'll focus on the estimating how this person sahadev will behave with dialysis suppose he was to undergo dialysis because we need to help him with that uh, his and his wife's conflict we need to resolve okay so some of the evidences um, is one is the surprise question so any nephrologist Seeing a patient who is 82 year old with that kind of background that you know I have put into the picture, um, it has been found that there is a reasonable what is it called as uh, it is a good uh, moderate to good reliability of the surprise question of a treating nephrologist who has been seeing this patient for the last uh, you know three and a half four years. So if if I ask if the nephrologist asks herself that would I be surprised if this patient were to die in the next six months and if the answer naturally comes as no then we need to say that we need to understand that we need to take it as a reasonably reliable it's a validated tool for beginning the thought of what would be appropriate for this patient so this is one of the things this is a very general tool but it is shown to have reliability for moderate to uh, you know good reliability and uh, uh, so the surprise question correlates with the mortality of CKD stages 4 and 5 and demonstrates moderate to good reliability. Second one is, um, sorry, why are those there? Estimate the prognosis with dialysis associated with other conditions. So what are the one year? This is a paper uh, which is uh, come in the JAMA in 2019 and it uh, discusses one year mortality of older adults after initiating dialysis and they correlate it with several uh, graphs here. I don't know how to get rid of this header. But the first one, as you can see, is age. And then second one is comorbidities, pre-dialysis functional status, and the actual initiation of dialysis, whether it started off as an inpatient dialysis, which is generally as a crash or you know emergency, or was it started in a due consideration and OPD. So suppose we put an older adult into dialysis, all these factors, you can see that all of them are ending at uh, one year. So at the end of one year, uh, the you can see that 54.5 was the uh, percent of the 391 patients studied died within one year, which means, uh, you know, this is something that we need to keep in mind, whether we need to, uh, this whether we start dialysis or not. With dialysis, the mortality of more than 50% of the patients is quite high by the end of one year. Okay, so this is one more consideration, the comorbidities. And uh, the, the there is another way of checking that, that is Charlson comorbidity index. And uh, these are all suggesting, both these are papers which uh, show that there is a uh, strong prediction of mortality of hemodialysis patients uh, with using the Charlson comorbidity index. And uh, uh, regarding unplanned readmission on maintenance dialysis or mortality, both are uh, you know associating well with the Charlson comorbidity index. So um, then, third thing is we very often if we look into the symptoms of uh, CKD, ESKD in an older adult, many of them overlap with the geriatric syndrome. So we need to uh, understand that. Uh, unintentional weight loss, increasing weakness, slowness, uh, you know, muscle loss, poor endurance, reduced functions may already have set in. And uh, many other patients, even younger CKD patients may have these symptoms. So it is important to understand that some of, because of these symptoms, sometimes what happens is older patients may get dialysis sooner because 
it is assumed that the CKD may cause it. But this, I don't know if it's a routine practice that frailty and geriatric assessment happens in a nephrology unit, but it would be helpful to have it because we can understand whether uh, you know that adds to the prognosis of how this outcomes of how this patient would do with dialysis. So this, uh, they have shown relationship of geriatric assessment as well as mortality and hospitalization in older patients where they have started dialysis. So they studied 192 patients with a mean age of 75 and the one year mortality risk was higher when the patients had more than three impairments through the uh, geriatric assessment. And the other one is the frailty scale and uh, poor frailty was directly associated with poor outcomes on dialysis. So we have covered uh, till now the surprise question, the uh, comorbidities, then uh, the frailty index. And uh, now we will move on to, there are some online calculators also available. This is uh, a Cohen calculator, which is looking at some of these factors that we talked about. And uh, you know, your poor nutrition and status, surprise question, presence of dementia, peripheral vascular disease. So those are also available in case, um, you know, we want to have a quick estimate of six months survival, 12 months survival, 18 months survival, etc. One more thing. Second, so one thing that we want, why do we want to start somebody on dialysis? One is survival. So we discussed some evidence based on, uh, you know, so, so that we can make a decision. So second thing we want is that it should at least add some benefit, which is for such a patient, it would be quality of life and decrease the symptom load. So the one which I've shown here is the IPOS renal where we can um, estimate how many of these symptoms are severe or overwhelming and through dialysis can we bring these symptoms down. So IPOS renal is one of the, and SAS renal also is available. These are Edmonton symptom scale, assessment scale. Both these are used in several nephrology departments which have um, kidney supportive care uh, integrated. And what they look into is uh, whether you know this is going to be of any benefit. So let us look at some. I have got three papers actually um, sort of uh, comprehensively put here. And based on the IPOS renal, you can see that the fatigue, tiredness with, this is on conservative pathway, these two papers, and this is on dialysis, uh, the pruritus, the uh, constipation, anorexia, the common symptoms, some of them are, if, you know, they at a, maybe at a different level, but symptom burden of dialysis is also um, high. So we need to keep that in mind that by dialysis, we cannot guarantee a symptom-free, high quality of life especially in a patient. So here the age group was 82 years and here the age group was 83. And uh, here also it was 82 years, average mean age. The third thing is about um, actually whatever time that is extended, because, you know, most of the time there is, you can see in this particular study, uh, which was published uh, quite, uh, quite long ago, 2009, with maximum conservative management, then is it equivalent to dialysis? So they found that on an average, uh, the conservative management patients, they lasted, for example, up to say 13 months or plus. And whereas dialysis patients, they uh, lived longer to almost like 37, 38 months. Now they did, this is a very interesting study, which was uh, done in Netherlands. And they found that the hospital free days, if you can see, which was almost 4.3 days of an average in a patient who underwent, though the duration of life was, you know, uh, 13 to 14 months, only 4.3 to 4 days were spent in hospitalization. Whereas in this group, where uh, this particular space indicates the hemodialysis time, and this space indicates the, uh, you know, hospital inpatient stays, so they uh, spend at least... Um, uh, more one and a half months of their extended life in the hospital, 47.5 days in the hospital. So this also needs to be looked into when we are looking at the benefit and burden. So other than the dialysis time, is rest of the time being actually utilized in doing what they want to do with full energy, good mood, and you know, with uh, all the preferences that they would want to do. So this is an important aspect. 
for the, all the survival benefit was quite evident, but the time lost in inpatient admissions, the dialysis time, the post treatment fatigue and you know tiredness and they have to be on bed and also tra travel to and fro from the hospital. All together, if you take, then the survival advantage becomes less uh, important. So we have sort of looked at the initial two aspects of clinical prospects and prognosis. So establish, estimate the prognosis, establish benefit and burden. Now, are there guidelines for guiding Sahadev who is refusing and his wife is wanting it happen? So we also have Renal Physician Association guideline published in 2010, which talked about shared decision making in appropriate initiation and withdrawal of dialysis. So based on this criteria, they have given some pointers, when can we forego hemodialysis and when can we consider? They haven't said forego or this is, you know, this is what is mandated. No, they have said consider foregoing hemodialysis if patients fall into these criteria. So this comes mainly in the recommendation five. So decision to not initiate or to discontinue dialysis, what they have said is if appropriate, forego dialysis for patients with whatever types of kidney disease, acute kidney chronic kidney or end-stage kidney in certain well-defined situations. Which are these patients with decision-making capacity who being fully informed and making voluntary choices refuse dialysis or request that the dialysis be discontinued. Or patient doesn't have decision-making but who have indicated refusal, um, either oral or written. Or patients who do not have decision-making but who have a legal surrogate and patients with irreversible profound neurological impairment such that they lack signs of experiencing life as in thinking, feeling, purposeful behavior or awareness of self and environment. Okay, so these are the background conditions and then you need to also understand there are the criteria. This is recommendation six. So with more than two of the following characteristics in a patient, we may consider foregoing uh, initiation of dialysis. So in an elderly age, 75 or 75 years or older. How about our Sahadev's 82 year? So definitely this applies. Clinical response to surprise question that I will not be surprised. So that also um, I would I would assume, I don't know if there is a way of interacting, but I, otherwise I would have taken a vote here. So would you be surprised and uh, what most nephrologist colleagues tell me that they wouldn't be surprised in a patient with some comorbidities and an age of 82. Then high comorbidity scores of high eight or more that we have to measure because I don't know Mr. S and his comorbidities. Then marked functional impairment. Uh, we have mentioned that you know he requires some support uh, in his daily activities. He's breathless. Currently, he's bedbound. Uh, but it may be reversible. So again, it has to be after clinical assessment. Um, if it is less than 40, that also is one of the criteria. Those whose medical condition precludes the technical process of dialysis. For example, patients with advanced dementia who will pull out the needle or patient has a cardiovascular condition which require, causes profound hypotension as you initiate. So it is not safe. Dialysis itself technically becomes unsafe. And those who have a diagnosed terminal illness from non-renal cause. So again, this is uh, individualized decision making. If they have good performance and all the others are okay, you may still consider. So all these criteria, if we have more than two criteria, we can consider foregoing. So there is some support to uh, Sahadev's claim of not wanting to initiate because we are not able to back it up by saying that, no, 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 it will be much better if you have dialysis and your survival or quality of life may be better. So that is the, <clears throat> so any any other patient with, you know, more number of comorbid doesn't matter. More than two is enough. So when we take decisions, the first question would be, what is the goal we are trying to achieve? Is the benefit more than the burden? So here benefit is not more than the burden based on the evidence that we looked into. Uh, is this a possible, feasible? Of course, we are discussing it because we are assuming the dialysis is accessible and affordable to the patient. but it is okay to forego in this particular reason because we have now looked into the RPA guidelines and Sahadev may fall into the category of, um, you know, poor outcomes with dialysis. So it is okay to forego. Third thing is the autonomy informed. Is Sahadev aware of the consequences, alternatives and the options if he forgoes? Now, this is the 
next thing that we need to do. So first is all the thoughts in our head, understanding how we need to think so that we have a clear idea of what communications and recommendations that we need to make. So we have done the first two steps. And the last step is to ensure that there is clarity through good communications. So here it may be important to Sahadev that, you know, I mean, and uh, Mrs. Sahadev more importantly about the uncertainty in benefit. Um, and if the person is understanding the details, we could even, you know, share some of the uh, issues that we just discussed medically. Given the age, we can say that he is at risk of certain setbacks and poor outcomes. And it may not confer the survival advantage and it may entail significant burdens which may detract from his quality of life. So all these are uh, important to convey because the wife may be just looking at uh, hemodialysis because it may prolong survival for sure or it may increase the quality of life, whatever the reason is. So now what is to be, okay, then what? So the nephrologist A may say there is nothing more we can do. And nephrologist B may say that, look, I am a nephrologist, you have a kidney disorder and, you know, uh, we are uh, dialysis is unlikely to help you, but we are here with you and we will support you in whatever way we can. And that is why I think this whole uh, talk is happening. So renal medicine continues to, uh, pro, you know, uh, help the patient by progress, low progression of the CKD and they are the experts in it, monitoring parameters, managing anemia, blood pressure, fluid electrolyte, calcium, phosphate, albumin, and nutrition, and managing the, if at all patient is going for RRT, definitely that comes. Palliative comes into the picture for managing symptoms and distresses. Decision-making is empowered by discussions and, you know, uh, emotional support and the medical aspects of symptom management. Uh, we, uh, we can facilitate patient-centered care planning. Not we, anyone who's trained in uh, generalist palliative care. So nowadays, Many of the countries, Canada, Australia, they have nephrologists getting board certified also in palliative care and they run kidney supportive care units, uh, in, in the dual qualified nephrologists. And of course, we involve the multidisciplinary team to improve the quality of life. And uh, this will be, the maintenance will be continued, including the end of life or maybe some transfer to a setting where we can take care of the last stages of the patient because patient can become very symptomatic towards the end. So renal replacement therapy or conservative kidney management, either way, there is much for the bi-speciality interventions to offer to this patient. And on an average, we have seen that uh, patients live anywhere between uh, 13 to you know, 16 months. Uh, this is an average. It can be much lesser. It can be longer. Okay, so um, important principles here are knowledge in prognosticating, which generally is a neglected uh, part. Diagnostics, therapeutics happen often. Prognostication is a neglected science during training. Then, you know, um, uh, information about what is going on in the world, what is the evidence looking like, and skills to communicate well, and the attitude of non-abandonment. So we can, um, instead, you know, this is one way I told you about the least helpful way of approaching this. Instead, we should uh, um, have our clarity and uh, we can um, talk to the talk to Mrs. Sahadev or the son or the daughter. Um, how long you know, we can begin the conversation by just asking them, uh, like, what are your expectations? What are your hopes? How long would you think people of you know your husband's age with similar health conditions usually live? Because that way we can begin to kickstart the conversation and then fill in. And this ask tell ask model of communication comes into value here. Okay, so. Next would be communication to support ethical decision. What would we tell Sahadev? Okay, uh, we don't want to continue with dialysis. Uh, instead, you know, so decision making, joint decision making, and goal oriented joint decision making. All of them are quite different. Decision making is when we tell them this would be what I recommend. Joint decision making is we may give one or two or three options and say, okay, you choose. And, you know, um, without giving them a real picture of what each of those mean. And so we say that we had told them, you know, this may happen, that may happen, but they don't know enough. But goal oriented, because you know, if you offer hemodialysis as one of the options and conservative kidney management as the other without explaining the details, they are likely to think that this is a very active treatment and conservative kidney is a non-active. So can you go multiple presentations from International Society of Nephrology have clarified that 
conservative kidney management is active therapy, just like how I just shared the list of things that we can do. So that has to be clarified. And goal-oriented is even more important. For example, going forward, so all these other aspects that we talked about, the statistics, you know, explaining again and again about, uh, you know, what will happen if you don't have dialysis or talking about a very, very remote possibility of transplant, all of that will be decision-making. We are making decisions and we are just trying to convince. So that is not what we mean. Okay, so um, suppose, uh, you know, we understand a little more about Sahadev, what, you know, what he would love to do. You know, I'm just creating the story part that he loves to maintain the garden that his wife had created. And when they moved into their home, his children are living outside and they, he's a maths teacher. So, you know, there may be so many roles that he's playing. And how would our um, dialysis and not dialysis affect those? So that is the thing that we need to discuss. So the Mrs. Sahadev needs to be supported with these kind of things. So um, I like the statement from this book written by G.E. Moore. It appears to me that in ethics, the difficulties and disagreements are mainly due to a very simple cause, namely to attempt to answer questions without first determining what the question it is that we are desiring to answer. So sometimes when we just look at ESKD parameters and you know symptoms, we get lost. But we should say, we should think of what exactly are their goals? What are they trying to achieve through this intervention? We may be very happy moving the serum creatinine from A to something else, but uh, you know, uh, what the patient, that is an effect. Whereas benefit is what the patient and family can uh, experience and enjoy. So we, we need to understand and differentiate the effect from a real benefit that the person can perceive. So um, next thing, once suppose we are going ahead with conservative kidney management, we have to also ensure not only Mrs. Sahadev is convinced or, you know, she prefers to maintain a conservative, whichever. Suppose she, after listening to the whole thing also, then if they have a discussion and they say there is hemodialysis, we can still give them a time-limited trial. But suppose they... Uh, you know, still need information, we can empower them. Does he comprehend the consequences of his decision? Has he been given the conservative option and uh, what that entails? And also determine what is most important to him. If he's going more towards, you know, uh, we need to, again, these are all trying to establish the goals. So we are able to do a goal-oriented shared decision-making. So what are the non-negotiables for him? What are the, uh, you know, things which he would want continued, what he wouldn't want, who's a surrogate, all these things come in once he refers, because now we are accepting a limited time. So we need to also discuss these parts. Now, we may be surprised from this study where they studied the health outcome priorities of old adults um, who with advanced disease and uh, what the nephrologists thought their preference would be and what the actual uh, you know, patients thought their preference. They studied 271 patient mean age of 71 years and 49%, that is half of them, ran maintaining independence as their top health outcome priority. And uh, almost as many, nearly 50% ran being alive as their third or fourth priority. You must remember that these bars are the first, like maintenance independence was the highest priority in this study, which was published in 2018. Whereas nephrology providers, they it was not at all aligning. They demonstrated limited knowledge of their patients' priorities because it is never asked in the intake form of nephrologist. These things are not mentioned usually. So just to finalize, you know, just to give an example, we know this very famous uh, poet Bharat Ratna and our ex-prime minister. He was uh, 93 years old with ischemic heart disease, stroke, dementia, and he underwent dialysis for so many months from June to. 16th of October, um, from June 18th to uh, October 18th. And towards the end, uh, he was also on ECMO support. And this, uh, you know, so this is the way, uh, especially if you're wealthy or more famous, in fact, uh, the end of life can become quite undignified, isolated and miserable because we think we are doing our best and without, you know, uh, looking at the whole picture. So this is just to give an example. Whereas in another country, where uh, you know advanced care planning and uh, these kind of communications are commonplace. Uh, George Bush chose to um, you know stay away um, from interventions, and at 94, 
he passed away in his own uh, home surrounded by family and uh, even his wife chose similarly and he uh, decided not to undergo so it is not about money it is not it is about proportionate appropriate treatment and helping them reach there through communications so a narrative based on personal biases and gaps like for example mrs sahadev may be a miscomprehension and we can help them make an informed narrative by sharing the right term. so we need to be compassionately listening and reframing the narrative so to make the right decisions we need to understand patient's narrative and the goal, clarify the goals of care, and then we will be able to recommend what may be appropriate. So we need to have expertise in the disease and the expertise, uh, the, only the person will have expertise on goals of care and you know, their story. So communication helps the bridge and allows us to have um, provide appropriate care. This is my last slide. So from no prognostication and without checking benefit burden and futile interventions, we can move slowly by updating the knowledge base available, evidence base in the kidney supportive care scenario, communication skills which may be acquired, it is trainable, elicit the goals and expectations, and then move on to goal-oriented shared decisions and maybe give conservative kidney management as an option, and then we reach um, ethical, empathetic, and proportionate care. What is most appropriate for that patient at that time based on his best interest? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nandini. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nandini. That was a, a lot of insight into what exactly is a palliative care with an index case, which is in fact a classical index case of you know, I mean, uh, ESRD, 82 years. So that, that makes a bet set like, okay, he's elderly. So embarking on to certain interventions and all may not be very, but on the other hand, we generally have an opportunity to look into the relatively younger group, may not be 80 years plus, but then relatively younger group. That's again, a different area, very complex situation as to how to manage. As you said, in Western world, it's already developed probably around oh, 15 to 20 years. And then there have been intense education and awareness, advocacy as to going on, even probably before the stage 5D is reached, probably even a stage 3, 4, depending upon the comorbidities and age. So my question is, are, uh, despite having the guidelines which are there, are there any Indian guidelines which probably suit our scenario? That's number one question. And how do we fill the gaps between the existing guidelines and implementation of such uh, guidelines into the clinical perspective? And uh, does Indian scenario offer something like a fellowship uh, or probably, you know, an additional uh, qualification that even the renal nephrologists are also uh, can avail such uh, entities so that it makes a comprehensive, you know, like uh, management of a patient. And of course, the basic question always lies in the treating physician, uh, the the reality versus the competitive interest in the, in the expanding horizon of the uh, many corporate and many other uh, hospitals you know, competitive interest versus the uh, reality of a particular patient. All these things are definitely genuine, but uh, uh, gray area as far as uh, our understanding goes, probably way down, we should be able to understand. Over to you, Dr. Nandini, for these few questions. So some of the questions I will attempt to answer. We're beginning with, you know, the guidelines. So uh, in 2017, we um, actually got uh, kidney supported care into India through a Zoom-based uh, training session, and which was followed by a master class where uh, six uh, groups of academic nephrology units were invited to, uh, uh, Dr. Shankar Prasad was also here, so we invited them to KMC Manipal, and along with palliative care physicians, and these six groups sat together. Palliative care physician and nephrologist was part of one group. So like that, there were six composite groups of, uh, you know, and then, uh, we discussed uh, multiple headings like decision making, then, you know, symptom management. So like that, we had this workshop and at the end of it, we came out with a publication as, you know, I don't, I wouldn't call it guidelines, but uh, the Indian Journal of Palliative Care has published uh, a supplementary and uh, Divya is here. So we had, I was at that time in Mumbai and working with KEM and we sat down and made algorithms for symptom management, which are also part of that uh, symptom management chapter in the 
kidney supportive care supplement that we published in Indian Journal of Palliative Care. It is open and available for everyone to use. Now, the other thing that has wonderfully happened is that International mm -hmm. Society of Nephrology has uh, now is working on several themes. And Dr. Shankar Prasad and myself, we are part of the working group on conservative kidney management. So it is coming out with a curriculum. And it has already begun. We are working on the curriculum. We are working on how to handle, what is the right approach to handle choice-restricted population, which we commonly see. Young patients absolutely fit. They should get dialysis and they can't because of access issues. So how do we approach that? And, you know, various other aspects of conservative kidney management, including um, all the things that, you know, we'll be discussing today also. So that is one thing that is going to come up at the global level. And we have been working on it since last uh, one and a half years and several uh, publications will come out of it uh, in Credigo level. And the third thing is we just completed actually um, I think about two weeks ago, we conducted what is called as Impact Nephrocare, which was a joint initiative of Indian Association of Palliative Care with Indian Society of Nephrology. And this was conducted as a seven module uh, training program and uh, it was, um, you know, available, it was mandatory for all the palliative care uh, MDs and um, DNB postgraduate students. And it was optionally available. So we had, you know, circulated it around and some of the DM nephrology students also participated in it. And several practicing nephrologists who, whom I had, we had initially called as faculty, they also continued to participate because they found it interesting discussion because it was purely Indian scenario, Indian context, and the discussions were very, um, you know, close to what day-to-day uh, -day practice was. And everything was based on examples, the real-life patient conversations on withholding, withdrawing. So we had videotape, all that. So those are available partly as, you know, resources which are uploaded. A lot of videos. We had a lot of international faculty participating. Dr. Mark Brown from Sydney, Dr. Frank Brennan from uh, St. George Institute, Sydney. We had Holly Conchiki from uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, we had uh, we had so many of uh, people from different uh, USA, USA as well as Australia because they are all running programs which are you know already uh, and we had from Indian context for choice restricted we had our own Dr Manisha Sahai who gave wonderful uh, resource about what is available in the government sector so she came in during the module on choice restricted patients because you know we need to know how to access the government sector program so that it is affordable. And what are the new things that have happened to improve quality? So those impact nephrocare is there. Uh, and, you know, those are going to be available. And if there is a requirement, you know, we can make that um, accessible to who needs to learn it. And we don't have to have assignments and all because that was meant for students. But just the reading of it and going through the modules, I can definitely support. And uh, all those who want to attend, can, I mean, go through it can attend. Uh, regarding the commercial interest, I think you all will be... Uh, better <laughs> to answer because <laughs> yeah i know i mean i posed a little tough question to you so anyways thank you thank you so much uh, it's a little gray zone probably uh not the right time or probably the right platform maybe uh, to answer about that uh so thank you thank you so much there are a couple of questions to you but i'll uh, come back to you for the questions in the qa session so we move on as we are a little behind the schedule so over to dr john for the further proceedings thank you dr nandini thank you so much Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. We now move on to uh, to see what happens with Mr. S. So I see that uh, the situation becomes more complex that his son in United States who is not with him pushes him to starting dialysis. So how do we approach this scenario? So for this, uh, may I invite the chairpersons to moderate the session? Uh, Dr. Manisha Sahai, who is uh, a professor head department of nephrology at Osmania General Hospital, Hyderabad, and uh, deputy chair uh, ISN CME committee, and Dr. Anuradha Raman, who is senior consultant nephrologist at uh, Kim Sunshine Hospital, Hyderabad, Dr. Muthu Jai Raman, senior consultant nephrologist at Chennai Robotics uh, and Urology Hospital, Chennai, and uh, Dr. Uh, Sonal Dalal, uh, who is uh, um, who is uh, uh, head of the department at Sterling Hospitals, Ahmedabad, and director Gujarat Kidney Foundation. Uh, may I request Dr. Sonal Dalal to introduce the speaker? Hello, everyone. Uh, we now move on to the next uh, discussion, uh, that is how to manage the symptoms of this patient uh, is, uh, which will be done by Dr. Jyoti Priya. Uh, she is a consultant nephrologist, MGM Muthut Medical uh, Center, uh, Kerala. Uh, over to you, Dr. Okay. Yeah. 
थैंक यू मैम What happened, Jyoti Priya? You're not able to hear. Yeah, one second, ma'am. Could you send it to Siddharth? Yeah, actually, I have sent it. Oh, can I share? No, can I share? Ma'am, I have no PPT. Siddharth. या Uh, is it seen right now? Yeah, seen. Put in this. Please go ahead. Yeah, it's in the slide slideshow mode, right? Yes. Okay. So thank you for that uh, kind words of introduction. So now our patient. Uh, okay, now S got a name right now, Mr. Sahdevan. Uh, he his son has pushed him to uh, start dialysis. now my uh, topics are to cover on how to manage his symptom burden while he is on dialysis and uh, and next part i'll be dealing with uh, renal supportive care so we all know in maintenance dialysis the patients have high symptom burden and until recently uh, as nephrologists our focus was predominantly on the numerical targets and the numbers and how to make everything perfect as per the guidelines but okay so but the routine symptom assessment is not yet universal or standardized in the dialysis care now coming to a patient mr sahadevan so he had agreed for dialysis so the first question is what is the choice of dialysis modality can he opt for hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis so the choice based on his comorbidities his preference and his capability as well as the social support so most older patients initiate dialysis with in center hemodialysis because of the convenience but on the contrary he can be uh, initiated into peritoneal dialysis as well as uh, hemodialysis peritoneal dialysis has its own advantage like he doesn't have to go to hospital he doesn't have to travel uh, there is no need of anticoagulation but at the same time he needs some support either he has to do it on his own or someone has to help him because in old age issues with the dexterity mobility vision problem everything can coexist and whereas in hemodialysis it's uh, appears to be an easier one because he just have to go to the in center for 4 hours and get it done so we can assume that our patient for his convenience purpose had chosen hemodialysis as the dialysis modality now next question so he has chosen hemodialysis what about his access so we know we have av fistula av graft we have a uh, tunnel catheters so what are the issues pertaining to elderly when choosing the access so the at the age of 82 he might be having coexisting diabetes peripheral peripheral arterial disease so the to get an appropriate vein for fistula creation might be an issue he might have a failure to maturation or prolonged maturation he can have a uh, access issues related uh, to poor uh, vein maturation and uh, in that case if av fistula is not possible he could even opt a tunnel venous catheter in fact that is considered as a reasonable first line option in individuals living with frailty now assuming he had uh, got a luckily got a good av fistula and he had started initiated his hemodialysis with this av fistula from what are the coming in the way of uh, av fistula uh, access the one symptom of uh, sahadevan the patient can have this pain on needle insertion so this is somewhat uh, predominant in elderly patients because they have the pain threshold would have reduced and on the background that he is he was not willing for dialysis and now we have initiated him on hemodialysis because of the pressure from the uh, sun 
So we have to find strategies to reduce the speed. So studies have shown we can adopt certain uh, cannulation technique modification in order to reduce the pain like buttonhole cannulation, bevel down position of the needle. Some alternative therapies like cooled fistula needles, uh, cooling the fistula to minus 8 degree, th uh, cryotherapy, program distraction, use of local anesthetic agents like uh, topical application of uh, lidocaine or a combination of lidocaine and prilocaine, then warm food bath, all of these can be tried. Now, suppose, think about a situation. He was initiated to a permanent catheter, tunnel catheter. Now, one of the fearful compli uh, complication we face is central venous catheter infection. So, strict adherence to infection control policies when handling tunnel catheter uh, and the cleaning the cannulation site in case of AV fistula should be ensured in the dialysis unit. Now, what are the intradialytic complications he can face? Considering his age and his multiple comorbidities, there is a high risk of intradialytic hypotension. So how can we handle this? So instead of going for a proper uh, four-hour dialysis session, we can have a shorter duration of dialysis or we can go for an incremental approach. Start with once weekly dialysis, then slowly up titrate based on his symptoms. And another issue he can face is after a standard hemodialysis, he can face a washout feeling. So in that scenario also, this incremental approach will help. Now, how should we modify our dialysis prescription in this particular patient? See, we know regarding the dialysis prescription, we have proper guidelines by KDGO, Kedoki, the target KT by V, the clearance, ultra filtration. But actually, do we have to follow all these in this scenario? See, even though there is a uh, guidelines do not say elderly have a different KT by V or young patients different one, but we have to focus on the patient and convert our dialysis prescription to a patient oriented one. So a low clearance could be acceptable, which can, which help him to uh, have an incremental dialysis facility and low hypotension and his medication that also should be to bare minimum. He can have a, res a more liberalized diet and uh, IV, iron and erythropoietin agents needed to uh, maintain anemia or solve anemia in a reasonable level. And uh, do we have to do routine laboratory tests? That again is a thing which we have to think. Maybe uh, the frequency can be reduced and we can focus on the symptom and the dialysis prescription should be modified in such a way that his symptoms are ameliorated rather than the numbers are in the perfect range. Now, next thing. He can have frequent interruption of dialysis because of one, as I mentioned, hypotension. The other one, what we face in elderly is back pain, inability to lie down for four hour period, muscle cramps. So in that we can uh, go for some non-pharmacological techniques like gentle intradialytic exercise, shorter dialysis with more frequent sessions. All these could help in this issue. Now coming to other symptoms he can face, in dialysis. So this is a, a picture I borrowed from Kidney International. This is actually a patient drawn one. We can see the multiple issues the patient is complaining. Ugly fistula, needle pain, nausea, bone pain, muscle cramps, uh, muscle wasting, itching, restless legs and uh, many other symptoms. So many of the symptoms he would have faced before dialysis and uh, unfortunately he might be having the same symptoms even now even after starting the dialysis. Now, as mentioned by my previous speaker, he will be having coexisting geriatric syndromes, frailty, falls, insomnia, dementia. All these can magnify the hemodialysis-related complications. Now, one important one is a higher risk of falls because of the balance issue, gait issue. He might be having high fracture risk due to high, higher incidence of falls and uh, osteoporosis. So his bone health needed to be taken care of. Uh, CKD, MBD uh, parameters should be checked and uh, uh, sh should be maintained in a position so that falls and fracture risks are avoided. And another issue Mr. Sahadevan or any elderly patient hemodialysis can have is increased risk of dementia. So studies have shown there is almost a 3.5 fold increased risk of cognitive impairment in HD group compared to age match control. Now, factors causing high prevalence of dementia are increased vascular burden, anemia, and as per DOPE study, we can see diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, 
cerebrovascular disease, anemia, all these uh, can be the uh, causative agents for dementia. Now, depression. This can be a very crucial issue in our patient because he was not willing for dialysis. He was pushed into dialysis and altogether as such, he has uh, so many multiple comorbidities. So depression, as we all know, it is one of the major issue which we face in our dialysis patient. One in five patients receiving dialysis will have an episode of major depression. That's what study says. And of that, less than 25 percentage only receiving treatment. So depression can lead to non-adherence to diet, medication and poor quality of life. Now, this is a, a picture showing the various factors that can result in depression. Apart from the physical issues, psychological issue, family stress, then uh, emotional uh, issues, all these can result in depression. And depression management, uh, it's better to go with uh, non-pharmacological therapy if possible. Studies have shown cognitive behavioral therapy is better than starting on SSRI. And in case if it is not responding, can go for SSRIs and even intradialytic exercise has shown uh, important uh, factor to reduce uh, depression. Now, another thing which our patient can have is fatigue. Almost 80% of the patients on dialysis experience this. It's a multifactorial thing. It can be due to anemia, malnutrition, vitamin deficiency, sleep disturbance. Many drugs we give, for example, for pruritus, we give uh, gabapentin or uh, pragabalin. All these can cause fatigue. So the treatment is, you, uh, if possible, address the reversible factors, good nutrition, regular exercise, and drug prescription change. And another one, anemia. We'll have to rule out the nutritional deficiency. And in case if he's anemic, considering his age, we have to rule out any coexisting malignancies. And sleep disturbance. He can have pruritus, restless leg syndrome, chronic pain, depression. So good sleep hygiene, cognitive behavioral therapy, and in case short-term drugs and even melatonin can be tried. Muscle cramps, that could be another issue which he is facing and uh, can try uh, doing intradialytic exercise and massage of legs and supplementation with L-carnitine and magnesium. Now, he can have symptoms to eating, especially dry mouth. So, we can yeah, ask him to use uh, candies, gums, and he can have nausea, vomiting. So, all these usually get tackled with dialysis, but sometimes patients still can have, especially this dry mouth and anorexia. And pruritus is uh, something which we all know is a one uh, problem. Even after starting dialysis, patient continues to have. And there we have to have a combination management of uh, using uh, topical as well as uh, systemic therapy. Pain, uh, it is mainly based on the find out the etiology, go for uh, uh, factors that can elevate, like if the patient is having any back pain, uh, weight reduction, or uh, if it is severe, go with the WHO analgesia ladder, start with uh, our paracetamol and then non-opioid and opioid analgesics. Now, patient can have restless leg syndrome, can correct iron deficiency or use gabapentin. Neuropathy, depending on the severity, can try uh, SSRI or pregabalin but make sure there is no drug-drug interaction. Constipation is another issue the patient can have, can uh, start him on lactulose or uh, can increase the dietary fibers. Now, our aim of the symptom management is to reduce the symptoms so that he is not having significant distress. Now, make sure one thing we have to highlight, I want to highlight, it's not necessary to resolve symptoms completely. If, it, if you can decrease the symptom burden, that will be enough. And follow a stepwise approach. First, rule out the contributing factors, maximize non-pharmacological intervention, and then go for pharmacological intervention only if needed. And if at all going, start at a low dose and titrate slowly. So I would like to uh, quote this uh, saying, in symptom management, I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding the twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. Now, coming to my second part, renal supportive care. We all know the CKD patients, that is advanced CKD patients, the number is increasing and patients who are older, frail, with multiple comorbidities, poor functional status. We have an increasing number of advanced CKD patients with all these issues. Patients with advanced CKD with or without dialysis, they have a high symptom burden and poor quality of life. So what 
is required is a holistic management. It is not the laboratory parameters based treatment. It is symptom based and a holistic approach. So in this scenario, the benefit of palliative care has uh, comes into place and it is needed throughout their illness trajectory. So when you say palliative care, the first thing comes to our mind is a terminal care, end of life care. But in case of renal supportive care, that should be started from early stages and throughout the trajectory of CKD that should be applied. Now, renal supportive care is an approach integrating nephrology and palliative care. So both should go hand in hand. And who should receive this care? It is not for patients who uh, pre prefer not to do dialysis or who stops dialysis. It can be applied for those patients who are doing dialysis having high symptom burden. And also we have to approach the, uh, and also patient approaching end of life also uh, can utilize renal supportive care. Now here we use the term kidney supportive care rather than kidney palliative care because Palliative care means we get a conception that uh, an idea that it is for terminal life uh, care. And there should be a collaboration of nephrologists, palliative care specialists, and a team with nurses, social workers, dietitians, and uh, patients should also get spiritual support. So here mainly focusing on symptom management, the decision making, and interdisciplinary collaboration and conservative care. So this is a broad umbrella. So it includes the symptom management, communication, shared decision making, advanced care planning, interdisciplinary team support, option for comprehensive conservative care, that means uh, CKD care without dialysis and end of life care. All these comes under the broad umbrella kidney supporting care. Now, KDGO in 2013 in Mexico, they held a controversy conference and there this issue, uh, this uh, topic of kidney supporting care was discussed and they have uh, laid a roadmap for this kidney supportive care. So we can see it is not in only in the withdrawal period, dialysis withdrawal period or death, we are using kidney supportive care starting from the beginning till the end. This is there in the CKD management. So, and last part, I just want to say there are certain strategies in kidney supportive care. One is the management of symptoms and quality of life, which we have proper tools to assess the symptoms and management should be made. So these tools were already discussed. And uh, second is prognostication. We have to estimate the prognosis and we have to inform the patient. So for prognostication, we have certain tools. So uh, it's agreed no uh, to, uh, tool is foolproof, but still patient should get an idea about the prognosis of his illness. And communication, nephrologists need to have a good communication skill and it should be communicated in a clear way considering the patient's emotion then shared decision making and advanced care plan. These two are very important. And in advanced care planning, the patient can decide or choose what to do in, in future, whether to continue dialysis or not, all these decisions can be made. Then comes the comprehensive conservative care, that is uh, without dialysis, how to manage the advanced kidney disease. And various uh, strategies are shared decision making and uh, support, psychological, social, emotional support to the patient. And patient-centered dialysis, this I already emphasized in my first part, rather than the values go with the patient-centered and to relieve his symptoms, the dialysis should be modified. We can adopt palliative dialysis where symptoms are tackled rather than the numbers. Then incremental dialysis is also a, supportive strategy, a strategy of supportive care. And foregoing dialysis and end-of-life care will be discussed in the further session. So to conclude, we know there are growing number of patients opting for conservative care without dialysis and in dialysis also there is high symptom burden. Now dialysis is changing from a disease center to a person centered treatment. Forgoing dialysis, the rate is increasing and the fact is despite the development of palliative care, there is an enormous gap between what we know and what we practice and integration of renal supportive care service to usual renal care is still lacking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jyotipia. That was an excellent uh, lecture and you have covered uh, the symptom burden in a very nice manner. So um, I just had a question. Sometimes there is a conflict between what the patient wants and what the attendants want. So how do you handle this? In case a patient is an elderly patient, he wants to uh, go for conservative uh, care and doesn't want dialysis. Whereas in this uh, example given, the son forced him 
to go for dialysis, so patient number one. The other one is vice versa. The patient wants dialysis, but he is financially dependent on the attendant who doesn't want to pay for dialysis. So what do you do? And the third question is, if the patient is so fed up of his life and wants euthanasia, so what is the legal take on that? So these would be my three questions. And um, again, thanks for a wonderful question. Thank you, ma'am. So actually, the the first two scenarios, something which uh, we face routinely, like patient doesn't want dialysis. Patient want, first is patient doesn't want dialysis, but relatives want, and vice versa. So here, I think uh, because in our setup, it is not insurance based or anything. It's uh, mainly first one patient should be financially sound. So whoever supporting the patient financially should also be convinced about the patient's decision. So in this uh, scenario, the most important thing is good uh, communication with the patient and the relatives and make it a team approach so that all these people are there and you can discuss it and uh, convey the, the importance of if if actually patient want so why the uh, bystanders are i mean uh, relatives are reluctant so a sort of proper communication is the key in tackling this situation and uh, regarding the patient asking for uh, euthanasia uh, unfortunately it is not uh, uh, legally permitted in our scenario but we can withhold dialysis it is not euthanasia withholding dialysis is not like uh, equivalent to euthanasia but still uh, there is no i uh, as far i know there is uh, if the patient is in sound mind and taking a decision to withhold dialysis that can be agreed but active euthanasia uh, so far is not allowed in our uh, setup okay. Okay. i have a question to you okay. you were discussing about the option for dialysis but of the two, hemodialysis and the, is, don't you think the peritoneal dialysis actually is called now as a palliative peritoneal dialysis, which can offset most of the complications like hypotension, cramps, tiredness, and hemodynamic instability all will be there. Patient will be at home. And if you think that the relatives don't want to be involved, you can always use a cycler and a nurse because Say NRA is unwilling to, it's a financial, uh, there is no problem. Don't you think that will be, that should be the first option given to this patient? Actually, IRA EDTA says that should be the first option given to the elderly patients, uh, frailty and other things you are describing. What do you think of that? What will you offer to this patient? Yes, ma'am. As you rightly told, many issues like intradialytic hypotension, coming to hospital, access issues, all these could be solved if a patient is adopting peritoneal dialysis. But um, uh, the problem is, again, cost is the issue, one. Second thing, when they are not willing, when we are saying that we are, this is the procedure you have to do, hearing the complexity of the procedure itself, they will back out. So, then the third thing, they have to depend on their family members. So, mm -hmm. if all these uh, negative things, uh, all the drawbacks are tackled and if the patient is willing, definitely peritoneal dialysis is a better choice. But some studies have shown patients, elderly patients on peritoneal dialysis, they have uh, uh, increased mortality compared to hemodialysis patient. But uh, again, that is to, pertaining to elderly diabetic patients. Uh, so if the patient is affordable, patient have a good support system, and patient is willing to do definitely PD could be an option. So choice of modality, there is no hard and for the, there is no rule like that which has to follow. If situation are favoring for a PD option, they can choose it. Particularly when you use the cycler, yes. when the, they can be taken care of a coordinator or nurse in the night. The, yes. the patient is free and he can eat better. The volume overload can be addressed too. And that should give a better lifestyle, I mean, quality of life than a hemodialysis with so many uh, comorbidities with this patient. Definitely. I think that should be offered first to the patient. Yeah. Because money is not the issue, the NRA guy can. Yeah, uh, NRA guy can. <laughs> uh, thank you, Hi. Dr. Nice talk, Dr. Jyotikriya. But just a comment mm -hmm. we have talked so much about uh, you know, joint decision making. But when it comes to practical issues, mm -hmm. uh, it, it usually doesn't happen. Because supposing uh, somebody comes from a credit organization and we as uh, treating doctors know for sure that uh, he's not going to make it, still, you know, the family just 
because they are not paying out of their pocket. You know, somebody is paying. So even for days and months on end, they want uh, doctors to do some magic and get the patient out of it. So these are some concerns, you know, whatever we talk theoretically, when it comes to practical aspects, sometimes we may not be able to really implement all what we want to do. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that was the point I was asking the question, ma'am, and thanks for bringing, bringing it up again. Sometimes after complete communication, everything, I think, Jyoti, you have also faced such situations where family wants something and the patient wants something. Sometimes it's very difficult. Yes. And then we have to decide with whom the power of attorney lies. And all those things are difficult because in India, we don't document it. If the patient mm -hmm. is an encephalopathy, then who takes the decisions? They are gray areas, but I'm very happy that we are at least talking about this. So, um, I mean, uh, this is the first uh, step to having a proper... Ma'am, pro sometimes uh, different children, like they, he might have three, four children. All these three, four children will have three like, difference in the opinion. So, again, yeah. we will have to be in a, we'll be in a dilemma. Yeah, so when my so mother was great. on CAPD, I can tell you that this is 30 years ago before Tanker started. Uh, she didn't want it because she, of an amputation. But all of us were very persuasive and we said we wanted to be with us uh, as long as possible. And then finally she gave in and said, okay, I'll carry on with CAPD until, I mean, she lived for a few more years with that. So it's a very difficult decision, especially if the patient's very depressed and doesn't want it. But as family members, always, you know, you'll want your mother or your father to live forever. Thank you. Priya, there is one more question. Can I ask? Hey, so my with the patient uh, says, I don't want dialysis. I, I don't I don't want that. Will it be considered as a suicide? And if you okay it, will it be considered as abetting the suicide for the patient? This is one of the questions asked. It will not be considered as a suicide, especially I, we heard our previous talk. It's his decision, considering the benefit and burden of the, uh, the disease, he can opt for uh, withdrawing from the dialysis or stopping it. So it cannot be considered as a suicide. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Dr. Jyoti Jan, please take over because we have uh, we are uh, half an hour behind the schedule. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience as well. I request the audience to post their questions in the chat box. Dina, uh, happy to have you here, Dina. Uh, welcome you. Um, so, I mean, I'll give you an opportunity to speak, uh, Dina. I mean, uh, probably in the QA session. Is it okay, Dina? Okay, I'm allowing you to talk. Dina, a quick question. Dina, I've allowed you to talk. A quick question. Please, Dina, can you uh, turn on your... Yeah, uh, she's you the can secretary talk. of the IFK of WKA. Uh, she's from Egypt. Yes, and yeah. she's Glad a neurologist. I think Glad there's some problem. You, Please unmute yourself. Dina, Maybe. can you unmute yourself and uh, start asking? Hello, the oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Just had yeah, some Dina. connection. Problems. Can you? Can we see you, Hi. Dina? Can we see you? Can we have your video? Can we have your video? Uh, Happy to have you on the platform, yeah, Dina. Yes, you can start asking the question. Okay. I don't know how to... Just a second, please. I'm trying to turn on the camera, but... Uh, yeah. Do I have this option here? Uh, no problem. Otherwise, you can start asking the question, Dina. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much for this very interesting um, webinar and for this very interesting uh, topic. And um, if I just may um, ask a simple, a very simple question, which is when should the nephrologist uh, offer this option? All the discussion is about the patient who wants to be on palliative therapy, the patient who does not want to be on dialysis. And um, all our debate is whether to accept it or not, or but should we offer, should the nephrologist start offering this for the patient or for the family, or it's kept just for the refusing patient? Uh, Dr. Nandini, can you take this question? Who are the patients in whom we can offer palliative care from the nephrology perspective? Yeah. Dr. Nandini? Yeah, yeah. to offer, not to just accept. 
to offer. Yeah, to yeah. offer. Yes. Exactly. Uh, practice in countries where it is well integrated, for example, uh, in Sydney, Canada, US and all, is there is something called as a kidney options clinic. So when the patient starts coming down from 20 to say closer to 15 EGFR, that is the time uh, they are, you know, they, where we know that the person is heading towards uh, dialysis. That is the time patient is referred to kidney options clinic. There, every, you know, many things about dialysis, different types of dialysis, uh, as well as conservative kidney management. And also, depending, for example, a person like uh, Sahadev comes up with 82-year-old, even the uh, mortality, you know, what are the prospects that they can expect? All of that is shared very transparently. They get a booklet, in fact, for a handout. And then, um, you know, it becomes very informed, empowered decisions. We don't have that system here. It is almost like if you don't give dialysis, like I heard some questions, is it euthanasia? Is it suicide? It is unfortunate because uh, if I don't want it and I am uh, like, you know, uh, I'm fully aware of all the consequences, I should be respected. My choice should be respected. If, if you have done the due diligence of telling me what is, uh, you know, in the evidence says and what is in, you know, what is to be expected and still I choose. For example, if I had a duodenal ulcer, which is, you know, perforated and the surgeon says that you will die if you don't get operated. And if I still refuse to operate, he cannot operate on me. Uh, uh, only thing is, of course, our job is to check if there is any psychological morbidity. Is it out of depression that the person is saying? That is our uh, obligation. But if it is not there, uh, we need to respect that decision. So there has to be a system in place before the patient reaches the stage of dialysis. So it is not to be even like, you know, ICU decisions and all should not be at the threshold of ICU. It should be when it is not required, but we foresee. So that is why the surprise question is more of a trigger to initiate such discussions. So that is what my answer would be. Because usually I feel when we offer, especially for the elderly and especially for the elderly who is um, very anxious and afraid of reaching the dialysis point, so usually if you offer this option, it will be the answer or it will be the choice of those patients. So um, uh, that, that's a personal thing, I know. It always, I always feel like it's a, a bias. Of, um, um, the patient will be um, um, influenced by his depression, by his choices. So if I put this option at the beginning, um, it, it will be always the option for the patients. So that's that's my question. Thank you very much for the very, very interesting um, uh, lecture and all the lectures. And thank you. And I'm very happy and pleased to be with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dina. Thank you so much for joining us from Egypt. Thank you so much. Over to Dr. John for further proceedings. Now, we shall now uh, move on to the panel discussion and I request, uh, uh, due to the lack of time, we shall stick to the time. Uh, so now we have an interesting panel discussion on uh, that. Now that our Sadhav patient is on dialysis, now he wants to stop dialysis. So for this interesting discussion, may I now uh, invite the chairpersons to moderate the session. Dr. Shruti Tapiawala, uh, Senior Consultant Nephrologist at Mumbai, Dr. Divya Bajpai, uh, uh, Additional Professor at KEM Hospital, Mumbai, and Dr. Kalpana Mehta, Professor Head Department of Nephrology at uh, BYL Nair Hospital, Mumbai. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. John. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here with all the uh, August um, um, specialist of palliative care uh, and uh, our fellow colleagues. And uh, uh, actually, the discussion or uh, to uh, Dr. Jyoti's talk has set the stage very nicely for this panel discussion as the talk uh, has ended with questions on uh, how we can uh, refuse or withdraw the dialysis and what should be what should be the approach to that? So as we all understand that uh, withdrawal of dialysis does not mean that we are stopping all the care. It is still conservative kidney management. It, it's one type of renal care and it's not the end of all care. So to uh, tell more about this um, difficult but very pertinent uh, aspect of kidney care, which is the end of life care, we have a very august panel, which is consisting of Dr. Mary and Mukadan. Madam is a professor and former head of the Department of Palliative Medicine at Tata Memorial Hospital. She is medical lead currently of a very, very nice institute. I have been personally uh, involved with Madam. She has even visited our department many times. and She has been very kind 
uh, to work uh, with us uh, in at KM Hospital. We still have um, her uh, students and specialists visiting our OPD every week. Uh, so she, she has set up uh, this very nice institute known as Sukun Nilaya, which is a center for palliative care for non-cancer uh, patients. And uh, it, it is actually unbelievable that in the city of Mumbai, their center provides in-house palliative care completely free, free of charge. It's like a blessing for our patients. Uh, she's also a consultant at Shanti Avedna uh, uh, Sadan, which is a hospice for cancer patients. And she works as a consultant at Sipla Foundation Children's Palliative Care Project. We are very happy to have you, madam. And I'm sure all our audience will be uh, really uh, benefiting from your uh, words of wisdom. To join, madam, we have Dr. Uh, Nandini Walat. Uh, you have all uh, heard uh, from her. Uh, she was also working uh, at KM and I have learned lots of uh, palliative care things uh, from her. She was the one who actually introduced uh, me to palliative care to begin with. Uh, she is currently uh, the professor and head of the department of pain and palliative medicine at St. John's Medical College, uh, Bangalore. Uh, and we have uh, Shank Dr. Shankar Prasad, sir, who is the professor and head of Department of Nephrology uh, at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. Sir is one of the few nephrologists who, uh, despite of their busy practice, is very, very invested in palliative care. And I have seen him personally uh, getting so much involved. And also, he works to bring uh, palliative care physicians and nephrologists at par. So he is the bridge amongst uh, these two um, uh, specialties. And uh, last but not the least, we have Dr. Jyoti Priya uh, Jyotindra Kumar, uh, who works as consultant nephrologist at MGM Murthu Medical Center, Kerala. She has given a wonderful talk in the last session. Uh, so we have a very uh, august panel with us. And uh, I would uh, like to give it over to Dr. Kalpana Mehta, madam, uh, to start with the panel discussion. Please, ma'am. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh... Actually, palliative care is usually is definitely is uh, uh, for doctors who are working in public health institute, where we are more focused on the acute care and day to day working with it. This is a very interesting topic and the situation what we have been hearing for long. Now, my first thing will be we have been uh, the situation which I have been uh, put all throughout the discussion is an elderly person who doesn't want a dialysis. My question will be to Dr. Nandini Valatek is, is it that is the only group who is the one who requires palliative renal care who says no for dialysis? In your practice, which are the other groups or other set of patients who usually land up saying, you know, I want the dialysis beyond this elderly 85 or 90 year old? So um, I clarify that, uh, you know, kidney supportive care is a larger umbrella term. It is given simultaneously with dialysis or in a patient with CKD with symptoms. So kidney supportive care itself can be with or without dialysis. And that is the usage of palliative care principles and approach in a patient who is undergoing dialysis. Second term, which we need to understand by definition, conservative kidney management. That is the option as one section of the kidney supportive care where dialysis is no longer applicable. It's only conservative management. So we need to understand that kidney supportive care is a larger umbrella which can encompass uh, CKD patients, ESKD patients on dialysis, not on dialysis, and even transplant patients who have a lot of symptoms or issues that require care. Whereas KM, that is conservative kidney management, is for those who opt not to have dialysis or, you know, so you can see that the spectrum is large. It is not that palliative care. Uh, somehow, you know, uh, I need to clarify that palliative care starts at diagnosis, even in cancer, because there are a lot of communication issues, symptoms, then, you know, decision making. So the same way, any chronic condition such as CKD, uh, also it has to be uh, not as early as diagnosis, but definitely when the patient has, you know, increasing symptom burden, and it doesn't affect their choices of whether they will undergo dialysis or not. It is maybe even enhancing the treatment adherence. We can help the patient do better and be more comfortable while they are undergoing a disease-modifying treatment like KRT, kidney replacement therapy. So it's a large umbrella. It's not, uh, I think the question was probably based on the idea of end-of-life care. 
which is uh, changed now yeah so madam i would say in, in our practice apart from this elderly people other group which we usually see who may require this is a multi morbidity ckd along with cancer who they their prognosis is poor and along with that this is the chronic kidney disease has come in another group of patients as you rightly pointed out madam is that kidney transplant especially those who are graft has failed now they are on just on maintenance immunosuppression creating four and five and they know they may not get the second graft so these are the few set which in our practice visually we see as an uh, uh, important groups who require a palliative care. over to you divya you are muted yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you madam uh, so now as we have decided that we have seen mr uh, s or sachdev journey and uh, the fact that now we are here uh, to discuss the approach of end to end of care we are also supposed to uh, find out uh, what are the legal perspectives to it so uh, there are there can be two scenarios either ideal in health when the person is mentally fit he himself does take the decision of uh, of uh, deciding that of of having his advanced care directives in place and then that they can be followed but sometimes such uh, advanced care directives are not made by many patients in our uh, country and so now my question is to dr mukadan uh, madam uh, what do you think if the patient is incapacitated who on uh, his or her behalf can take these advanced care uh, decisions or whether uh, or if if they are not able to take whether the physicians uh, are in a position to take that decision and what are the legal aspects of it whether will we can be in any trouble if we uh, overstep our boundaries thank you uh, thank you very much divya and thanks to the organizers for introduce in in um, keeping me into this i'm just new to kidney palliative care but i'm really trying hard into integrating palliative care into kidney especially in the municipal hospitals so yeah i mean there is no end of life care policy in our country as of today but what we do have is this group called illicit which started almost 10 years ago with people from palliative medicine critical care medicine and neurology and they formed this group because there there is because there is no end of life care policy but what we do have are two things that we all can refer to for whenever we need one is the national accreditation board of hospitals who has this own end of life care policy and the other is the ai ms that is the all india institute of medical sciences who have given their end of life care policy and i was talking to dr rup gosnani this afternoon and he said that yes whenever they have these difficult decisions they will refer to the aims end of life care policy so what is its state as you said rightly when you have an advanced directive it's it's there and therefore you know you can go ahead and do whatever you uh, whatever is prescribed by the patient there is not that much option for the doctor to you know it's so the shared decision making has to take place prior to the advance care plan if there is no decision then you have to go by the organ transplant act which then has it which is also laid down in the aims policy where the family members can take decisions on behalf of the patient so first is the spouse or the partner depending on who who is closest to the patient then are the children then are the siblings and sometimes even the parents so there are well laid down you know like what to say directives how it can be done but as we've been listening in this conversation there would be like someone who takes a nice decision with all the family members in india and then somebody comes from the us like in this particular patient's case and says no i want to do everything and probably that is where the doctors and the psychologists and the social workers the whole team of palliative care would be able to come in and they will go to shared decision making so it's not only about you know only patient only family only doctor it has to be a shared decision making and uh, just to support what dr nandi has been saying it has to start much earlier than when the patient was incapacitated if there are if something is laid down at diagnosis itself or in conservative kidney management then we have documented it we have written it down the patient has written the family members have written their sign and that's legal enough in our country as it stands today but the lsc is working very hard and let's see i mean the supreme court advance directives came because of them 
and I think they will progress at some stage. We will have an end of life care policy. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, over to Shruti, madam, for the next question. So that was uh, a very enlightening uh, uh, way that, you know, how we can uh, appoint a person who can uh, tell us what is to be done for the patient. But Dr. Uh, Shankar Prasad, we would like to know further that, you know, if a patient already knows that, you know, he is he or she is going to be progressive CKD and knows today's educational level is good, today's awareness levels are good. Say the family is prepared that, okay, I know one fine day I have to go on dialysis or, you know, uh, what is the future of my illness? How can we guide our patients towards advanced uh, life care plan or advanced directives? How do we approach the family for it and how do we go about it? Dr. Shankar Prasad. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Shruti, madam. So, good evening, everyone. So, I will go with this case only to just to, uh, so that everyone will be clear. So, Mr. S is there. His son had a first there was a conflict. So, obviously, so we have dialyzed him. So, whatever the hemodialysis we have done. Now, both are thinking that it is not good to continue. So, first, uh, as we do here, like we first assure ourselves, like as a nephrologist, that he has comorbidities. He's 82 year old. We'll look into his comorbidities. He has some significant comorbidity. And we are usually see surprise question, we assess his symptom burden on dialysis. If we think that his survival is not so going to be great in next 12 months, then once we are confirmed, we and our palliative team, we have a renal supportive care team, we call for a family meeting. That's basically patient or family centric. First, we identify here the patient is conscious. If you think, then patient will be there and the family member, that is his son. I, obviously here, his son is the one who is making the decisions which made the patient to go on dialysis. So we will see any conflicts of resolution among these two. And if it is not there, then it is easy for us also to explain them that uh, uh, there is uh, not really beneficial for him to continue dialysis and give the option of withdrawal of dialysis and how the end of life will be there for the patient. And once the collective decision is made in a family meeting, First thing is uh, we will assure them that his care will be continued other than dialysis. Means will be offered conservative kidney management, his symptoms will be absolutely continued. Of course, pill burden we reduce and psychological and even social support, we involve our uh, core teams to help the patient and our palliative team will be always aggressively involved with him for the symptom management. So once that is assured, we the next thing is the documentation. So we document the process uh, with, we have blue map here that only we are using at present. We don't have a separate advanced care directive or advanced care planning the, the format for ourselves in the renal supportive care, which we use for other ICU patients also. But we document the what the patients wish along with the treating nephrologist, palliative care physician. And if patient is in ICU, we involve the intensivist. Otherwise, our myself and the palliative care physician will involve. In addition to make sensitize our students in all the family meeting, we make sure our registrars also participate like nephrology registrar and the palliative uh, the MD student will be involved in that. So the documentation is important in that. Again, we reassure the patient that it's a dynamic thing that they can change the decision. Means he may come back again, say that I want to continue dialysis. At that time, we again re-change the decision. You should not think that it's an something uh, uh, documentation. Once he has uh, promised that he has to uh, stick to that, he can change his decision always. That makes them more comfortable. And the end of life care decision, most of the time we involve our palliative care strongly so that they take care of the patient with the symptom management and also the withdrawal of dialysis. We explain in detail to the patient and uh, we continue with the process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, Kalpana, ma'am, uh, would you like to take the next question? Yeah, uh, Dr. Jyoti Priya has very, uh, very nicely explained us that once the patient uh, has made, I mean, how to take care of this palliative care. And she has very uh, nicely taken through us, not only end of life care, but also gone through the renal supportive care. I mean, renal protective care and renal supportive care. Now, with and how to handle out the symptom burdens and everything. What I need to ask, I want to ask question is that what exactly is a nephrologist's role? 
me being a nephrologist and more into acute care day to day, I feel I am able only for taking care of mainly the renal supportive care and helping them to making decisions by giving them the proper data and guidelines and making and helping them to make an appropriate decision. And also, of course, taking care of the symptom burden. But the other aspect of it's more of a nutrition, spiritual, psychological, there should be a better team to handle it. So who should be the group members of this whole palliative care beyond nephrologists? Yeah. Uh, actually, this is uh, not a, a nephrology uh, run show. It is an interdisciplinary approach. So definitely a nephrologist is there to manage the symptoms and the disease related things only he will be he or she will be the expert. A palliative care specialist should be in the team because towards the end of life care or towards the advanced stage or in the scenario where he decided to stop the dialysis, his symptom burden will increase and it will reach to a distressing level. So at that time, definitely a palliative care specialist should be there. And third one, a dietitian. Because here, the role of dietitian is not like the dietitian where we employ for uh, advising the CKD diet. This is for the patient should have a liberalized diet, yet he shouldn't have increasing burden of symptoms. So a dietitian role is there. And fourth one, a nurse. A nurse is something which is there. It can be a renal nephrology nurse or a palliative care nurse. And then we also need social worker because this is like it's going to be a very complex thing once the patient reaches the end or the advanced life care uh, area. So we need a social worker and he should be able to uh, coordinate the family members and the uh, uh, patient's decision. And another thing, even we need a spiritual leader, they say a chaplain or a spiritual person in this group, because as the disease advance, it's like, a, it's not physical or mental, it is psychosocial, there is ethical issue, there is spiritual issue. So all these should be tackled. So a team should be there with nephrologists, palliative care specialists, a dietitian, a nurse, a social worker, as well as a spiritual leader. So that should be the team which is needed to have a, or to do have a proper renal supportive care. Thank you. Well said. Yeah, yes, the lecture was extremely good, Jyotipri. I must say that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. That is absolutely true. Actually, it's a need of the hour to now that all the institutes, at least we should come together uh, with our palliative care specialist and all the other stakeholders. And we should start building such teams where uh, these decisions can be taken together with involvement of patient and their uh, caregivers also. So uh, in uh, the want of time, uh, I would uh, like to uh, give it over to Dr. John uh, to uh, proceed with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Divya. Uh, so we shall now uh, move on to the next session. Um, so for this interesting session, also now that our patient has stopped dialysis, is uh, run ran into an emergency. So for this session, uh, we have may I invite the chairpersons to moderate this particular scenario. Uh, Dr. Arpita Roy Chowdhury, who is um, uh, professor head at Department of Nephrology, IS uh, Institute of uh, Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, SSKM Hospital, Kolkata. And Dr. Uh, uh, Monali Sahu, uh, who is a um, uh, consultant nephrologist at Midas Super Speciality Hospitals, Nagpur, and uh, President Nephrology Society, Nagpur. Uh, Dr. Saiwani, who is uh, uh, head department of nephrology at uh, 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 Nandyal Medical College. Uh, yeah, may I uh, request Dr. Monali uh, to uh, introduce the speaker. Munali is joining and rejoining as panelists. I think we, yeah, Dr. Munali, can you mute, unmute yourself? Yes, Dr. Munali. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really thankful to be a part of this vibrant group. And I came to know lots of important uh, uh, organization like IFKF and I would be happy to meet and uh, I mean, connect with President Latha, madam. And um, uh, let's now proceed to our next talk, Mr. S now is uh, rushed to a ventilator and we come to know that he has got a bill which is made already and has wants to take care of his uh, medical care as per his directives. So what do we do in such a case? 
So I would like to invite Dr. Anuja Damani, Madam, for this wonderful lecture on this topic of, uh, uh, which is really interesting. Madam is Associate Professor in Department of Palliative Medicine and Supportive Care at Kasturba Medical College, uh, Manipal. Over to you, Madam. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Madam. Um, so, as introduced uh, by our moderator, we are here with the situation with Mr. S. This is the situation. So, question is whether we can stop ventilator and uh, can advanced care planning be done? These are very different questions right now. In an emergency situation, we are looking at stopping ventilator, but advanced care planning would actually deal with whether we should be starting ventilator in the first in the first place. So what we follow here in Manipal, if this patient had to come to an emergency room in Manipal and already ventilated, and then, uh, you know, uh, we are referred uh, from the emergency department and we are said, or the nephrologist, and we are said that, okay, we need to discuss about the plan for this patient. And patient has expressed any wishes previously. Then comes to comes in picture, how do we determine medical futility here? Why this has happened? And whether it's futile medically to continue treatment. Then uh, a consensus is sought amongst the physicians. I'll go through the process in details. I'm sure uh, Dr. Shankar Prasad had briefly uh, introduced the process in the last, uh, uh, last session. But... Uh, Blue maple is something that is an uh, end-of-life care pathway that we follow in Manipur. And uh, we have a lot of communication and then a proper documentation of this uh, life-sustaining or life-limiting treatment and the process of providing end-of-life care is initiated. So if this patient has to come here, first is to establish medical futility. And this is done by the treating team, which in this case would be a nephrologist and the intensivist and a palliative care team. But mainly the treating physician has to first medically determine that it is futile to continue the further management. Then this uh, plan is discussed with the family. Of course, it is a shared decision-making process. This is not forced into the uh, uh, minds of family, but at least uh, it is important for, for the medical team to portray it to the family that what is the outcome that is anticipated. If there is no previous documentation done as choices of the patient, then the family, as Dr. Mukardin had mentioned, that there is a system, there is a way that is uh, that we approach. And there is next of the kin that is given by the Organ Donation Act. We'll bring in the next of the kin in the picture and then make a shared decision, document the decision. This decision is approved by the secondary committee of hospital and then uh, the withdrawal or withholding process starts. Now, how do, you, how do you actually determine that whether continuation of care is futile? So, continuation of care in a ventilated patient, whether it is futile or not, is determined by various characteristics. These are patient characteristics, that is what was the performance status, where there was, whether there are comorbidities, how bad is the critical illness? And of course, the surprise question. So surprise question can be, a uh, surprise question can have a duration of one year or it can also have a duration of one week or few days. So uh, uh, you can actually ask yourself whether you would be surprised if this person has to uh, worsen within next few days. And uh, if the answer to your question is no, then probably you have the answer to your medical futile. So clinically, a, clinical, a clinician's judgment is also extremely important and this is based on a lot of other clinical factors that this patient has. Second is level of effort. That is a lot of, lot of times in our setting, we see logistics cost is the issue and you know continuing treatment is more burden to the family and the patient rather than uh, withdrawing the treatment and also about patient preferences and wishes and family preferences and wishes. We look at the nature and extent of disease itself. 
and we look at expected outcomes, whether we are doing justice by continuing uh, the justice to the outcomes of this patient by continuing uh, the ventilator support or not, that needs to be considered. And this decision making is not individualistic, not intuition based. It is very much a team effort. It is based on evidence. It is justified uh, by the uh, medical plan uh, is justified by and the decision is justified by the evidence. The documentation is done properly and the, that same decision is communicated throughout to the team as well as the family members so that everybody is on the same page. There are, of course, a lot of ethical considerations in decision making. So ethical considerations can be whether there were any previously uh, documented wishes, whether uh, or not resuscitation orders were in place, whether we are planning to withdraw the treatment or withhold escalation of treatment, whether we can offer a time-limited trial wherein this patient may improve or uh, uh, and discontinuation of life sustaining treatments, what would it mean to the patient? What would it mean to the families? What all life supports, artificial life supports are we going to continue? What all are we going to discontinue? And whether we should uh, continue hydration or nutrition or continue palliative uh, and continue, how do we continue to manage uh, symptoms and provide uh, uh, optimum palliative care for the patients after we remove the supports? Okay, so... Uh, Basically, we have Blue Maple and there is a, a role of palliative care team here. The role is basically to uh, coordinate care throughout uh, the entire process, conduct family meetings, explore understandings, information needs of the family, acknowledge their concerns and limitations of treatment. It's of course, uh, it requires a lot of communication and uh, very good communication skills for the nephrologists as well as the palliative care physicians. Uh, the role of palliative care is also to have meetings with the treating physicians, ICU teams, coordinate plan of care between the teams as well as uh, discuss it with the family, document what are the shared decision making aspects, whether we, we are planning to de-escalate or non-escalate or and provide optimal symptom relief and have an end of life care plan in place according to preferences of the patient and family. These are the forms that we use in our setting. And uh, this is a blue maple form. So first form is about uh, documentation. What you see here uh, is the documentation of medical futility. This is filled by the uh, medical team. So especially by the treating team. Uh, wherein treating team has uh, understood uh, or has come to a consensus that continuing medical care for this patient or continuing artificial life supports for this patient is not going to be helpful. The same is communicated to the family. The uh, document about communication of these decisions is uh, signed by the family as well as treating team. In, and uh, other doctors, including ICU team, as well as palliative care team who are involved in discussions. The form again about declaration that family's directive towards uh, withholding or withdrawal of life supports. And uh, this is again signed by all family members, as well as the next of the kin uh, in the family members, as well as the three, treating, uh, three teams involved in discussion. This form after signatures are also go goes to a second uh, uh, committee in hospital, which is uh, manned by uh, the medical superintendent, head of uh, clinical forensics and member secretary of IEC. And after the signatures, the process of withholding or withdrawal of life supports start. So there is a clear consensus amongst the primary decision-making team of the hospital, as well as the secondary team, which is uh, manned by the uh, uh, three independent uh, heads of the uh, different units of hospitals, which are concerned. So uh, this is the kind of setup we conduct family meetings in. We do have a counseling room in the ICUs, uh, ICU complex. And after withdrawal or withholding or of escalation, after the decisions are made, we do transfer the patient to a separate room where family can be with the patient and we are providing optimal symptom management as well as, uh, you know, continuing the uh, care or continuing uh, uh, support for the family as well. So uh, this is kind of setup we have here. And... Uh, 
this was regarding end of life care there's other side to it that is advanced care planning so how do we initiate advanced care planning the uh, basis of initiating advanced care planning is very much involvement of a, a kidney supportive care team at the earliest in the trajectory and we've had uh, some discussions about this uh, during our uh, earlier sessions so what we do here is we have a lot of interdepartmental meetings, we do joint ward rounds, we have case discussions, individual case discussions, conducting family meetings, coming to a shared decision making, providing a continued supportive care to these patients who are undergoing dialysis and this kidney supportive care clinic is placed right in the dialysis ward, dialysis unit, wherein we are actually following up with the dialysis patients, discussing their concerns and symptom management. This is the form that we use here uh, to uh, address symptoms and assess dialysis patients and to give a proper holistic management. You can see here in this uh, form, we do have a column about uh, you know, what are the major concerns of the patient, whether they know about their diagnosis, what are the care goals of this patient, what, what is the patient expecting? What is the doctor expecting and what are the shared care plans? So uh, we do have a, a sequential documentation of the care plan and also the concerns of the patient so that everybody is on the same page and knows about what is going on with the patient and the families. Uh, about advanced uh, documentation of advanced directives in blue maple form, we do have a self directive for withholding or with withdrawing life sustaining treatment. So if a patient after knowing uh, uh, about what are going to be the consequences of withholding uh, or withdrawing a certain treatment, which is a life sustaining treatment, after understanding the consequences still wants or still chooses not to go ahead with uh, uh, that kind of uh, life-sustaining treatment, a patient himself or herself can go ahead with documentation and this again has to be signed by the primary hospital uh, team which will include uh, the ICU physician as well as the nephrologist and a palliative care physician. Because uh, self-directive is the autonomy, patient autonomy is something that matters and uh, uh, self-directive is always uh, holds a uh, highest uh, uh, value. And uh, if the patient comes and tells us that I want to document my directives, this is a form that we use in our setting. Uh, so in uh, two years from 2021 to 2022, we have seen the statistics. This are, uh, uh, last year, till last year, we had around 4,000, uh, uh, four and a half thousand patient, uh, patients who were uh, admitted to ICUs. And uh, uh, amongst those, uh, we do have a critical care review board, which is uh, appointed by the hospital. So those patients who have prolonged ICU stay uh, we do determine medical futility and we have discussions about med medical futility by this critical care review board and uh, those patients who uh, are determined medically futile, we do have a shared decision making and we discuss uh, with families. Sometimes one discussion is not enough. We do require multiple settings, multiple discussions with the family, uh, under uh, understanding their perspectives and making shared decision plan. So, uh, lot of patients, almost like 480 patients were referred to palliative care in these two years and the outcomes were uh, uh, about uh, withholding or withdrawal of uh, life-sustaining treatment. When, uh, when we did the analysis of CKD5D patients, we saw that in two years we had 98 patients who were CKD5D admitted to ICUs. Mainly, one, uh, the, the, these were patients with multiple comorbidities main cause, the leading cause of admissions were infections and uh, the reasons why in these discussions of withholding and withdrawal were initiated with these patients were because of worsening hemodialysis, uh, hemodynamic status and uh, worsening uh, uh, CKD status. So uh, we found that uh, 23 patients out of this, that is almost one in four patients underwent uh, withdrawal of uh, life-sustaining treatment or dialysis. And when we went back to these caregivers to look at their experiences, we found that uh, 
uh, there was a positive impact of overall having discussions with these families about uh, withholding or withdrawal of dialysis or life support. And uh, no family member did express that there were any guilt feelings. And they had positive rating on involvement of palliative care team during uh, final hours uh, to uh, uh, of their uh, final hours of their dear ones because they could spend time with the person they could uh, 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 we could manage symptoms better and uh, overall the end of life care experience of these caregivers was better than uh, 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 better and uh, they could actually say a proper goodbye to their loved ones so uh, that is about what we do in our setup but uh, there were a lot of questions during previous discussions about uh, what are the legal provisions in India. So let me give you a snapshot of what has happened over a period of uh, last many years about the legal system in India. So uh, it has evolved from 1996 onwards where there was no right to die. The Supreme Court had said that there is right to live with dignity, but that death has to come naturally. And we have evolved beyond that. Uh, in 2011, Supreme Court judgment permitted the withholding or withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment in patients who lack capacity to exercise judgment. In 17, the uh, uh, Supreme Court did recognize right to refuse medical treatment as component of right to privacy of a person. But in 2018, which was a very uh, remarkable uh, change in uh, the provisions, the legal provisions that was uh, that happened in India was a Supreme Court grant granted a legal recognition to advance medical directives and uh, it laid down guidelines for withholding or or withdrawal of life sustaining treatment. So. Supreme Court now has revised in 2023 these 2018 guidelines and I'll show you what are the revisions and how uh, it has changed uh, our perspective or our legal, uh, uh, you know, uh, legal system. So this is a paper that has been published very recently and it talks about these changes in uh, laws that uh, have happened in India. So there were... Uh, talks about advanced medical directives, living will, and uh, uh, you know a process of documentation during 2018 guidelines. But it was very difficult uh, process that was uh, placed in by the Supreme Court uh, for documentation of uh, uh, these kind of processes. In 2023, 20, these guidelines were revised and the, it, the rules has, have been uh, uh, made much easier. So advanced medical directives, are acceptable and instead of uh, you know ex executing it before a judicial magistrate of first class now can be executed before a notary or gazetted officer living will again is acceptable and instead of keeping it in co custody of district court which is not accessible to the healthcare uh, professionals to understand living will is a part of national health records now it is a part of national health records and it can be accessed by the doctors and hospitals then uh, the uh, hospital board there are two hospital boards that have been told to uh, 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 that have been recommended so first hospital board uh, can comprise of treating physician and two subject experts of at least 5 years experience which was previously told to be a 20 years experience and it's very difficult to create a hospital board with people with 20 years of experience so again this rule has been relaxed then a uh, second board constituted by hospital will not uh, will comprise of two subject experts who are not a part of primary board so instead of having collector and district chief medical officer and other three experts so instead of a very broad second board they have made it easier for hospitals to get a second board and uh, again instead of judicial mag magistrate coming and visiting the hospital to sign off withholding and withdrawal it is the hospital's responsibility now to intimate the judicial mag magistrate before withdrawal and withholding of a uh, 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 in a person's case so these are the relaxed guidelines in 2023 that have been provided by the supreme court
and uh, this is the same flow chart that has been taken from the uh, article by rk mani uh, it says how uh, the supreme court has now changed the guidelines and uh, uh, how do we implement it is in form of blue maple so a uh, blue maple was introduced in our hospital in uh, uh, 2018 after the first judgment of supreme court and then uh, with uh, so much of evidence for around three years, uh, uh, around five years, we have uh, now come to this 2023 judgment. And uh, the Blue Maple document has, has been a, an important part and the results of the uh, implementation of Blue Maples have played, have played an important part in revising this uh, Supreme Court judgment. So- uh, Sorry, If I may interrupt you as we are running short of time, can you- uh, Yes. Please? So I would just say that, uh, there, there are evidence-based ways to recognize medical futility. We are at times lost in the disease and the process so much that we often, often miss the bigger picture. So uh, in each patient's case, we need to look at the bigger picture. And what holds us back is our own difficulties or our own challenges in communication of, uh, uh, of kind of, uh, uh, in the communication towards the patients and families. So there are other guidelines or other uh, places in India which follow some guidelines. These are the guidelines that were provided by ICMR for, uh, and they provided the definitions or, on uh, different terminologies at end of life care. Uh, there is also a DNR, DNAR form that have been recommended. FIKI, as uh, Dr. Mukarden had mentioned earlier, Elicit uh, Group along with FIKI has provided some uh, decision-making guidelines. AIMS does have a policy uh, uh, towards end-of-life care. So these are various other uh, uh, centers, which uh, other systems in India where end-of-life care processes are being documented. So I'll stop here and I'll open the floor for discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anuja. That's been really a very informative talk. Yes, madam. Good evening. So uh, I think today's webinar really graduated us, nephrologists, to a new uh, uh, stage, to a new chapter. I have learned a lot through it. In public sector hospitals, most of the time, the similar end-of-life decision care the end of life decision has been taken up by patients relatives with a short discussion with us which did not uh, of course uh, involve so many uh, people in it that is a dama or lama situation everyone who are trained in public sector or working in public sector we have seen this happening many times and uh, i used to think that when dcd will evolve as a legal provision this dama or lama situation may come up uh, to be uh, incorporated in end of life care discussion and uh, in uh, uh, graduating to donation and today's discussion uh, further enlightened me that there is a scope of opening up in uh, public sector also also we are very much restricted by time uh, few number of people uh, looking after a lot of patients so, so patient burden but uh, definitely a new chapter is going to be opened up and particularly anuja this legal provisions these are these are new to us and uh, i have enjoyed the session thoroughly jyoti priya's talk and your talk both uh, really Thank helped you. us a lot and that was a wonderful presentation i have one question anuja and what about that palliative dialysis would you advise or not uh, so, uh, ma'am, we have had patients wherein uh, for management of symptoms, uh, sometimes the dialysis uh, was performed, but uh, it is again uh, in consensus with the patient's choices as well as the family's choices. Sometimes there were families who chose to have end-of-life care path and rather uh, palliative sedation. Whereas some patients do choose palliative dialysis uh, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, symptom control. So uh, that is, again, a gray zone. 
and again we have to go back as dr shankar prasad had mentioned earlier that uh, it is not uh, uh, it is not written on rock once we have documented not to go ahead with dialysis we can always go back revise the choices and uh, goal is to keep the patient comfortable so it is always about what do we intend to do uh, intention may not be prolonging life intention may be to reduce the symptom burden make the patient comfortable yeah. and if that is understood by uh, everybody and everybody is on the same page including the patient then probably it is a possibility to do a palliative dialysis and offer that to a patient if they want to do it and how would you advise withholding of ventilator and withhold withholding of dialysis both are one uh we have had patients who have had who who said that okay we don't want cpr to be done once the patient arrests but we don't want to uh, you know withhold ventilator support so it is it is like doing half hearted attempt but uh, it, we we really don't know what the belief systems of people are so it's always exploring more on why they are saying what they are saying so what is their understanding so many times we have to go back to the family or a uh, family or the patient if that is about advanced care planning and advanced medical directives that what their understanding of artificial life supports is and what happens if we uh, continue some supports and do not give complete attempt to it so i feel communication is the key everywhere if we communicate very clearly what is going to happen and give them a choice to understand they might uh, you know want to uh, uh, withdraw completely or even sometimes some people want to continue with life sustaining treatment so that is ultimately their choice it's not a forced decision it is always a understood very informed decision yeah many times we come across this paradox uh, dr saiwani i think i need to interrupt you uh because i think we are we are one hour behind the schedule running i'm sure the speakers and the other panelists are also nodding heads along with me so i think i think we should have a dedicated session for the whole uh, you know the the palliative care in nephrology okay. because lots to explore and lots to be known because all practicing physicians would like to know when to say no that's very crucial for us we know when to say yes and even patients know when to say yes for the treatment but we also should know when to say no for the treatment and of course we should be offered supported and empowered by the ethical and legal aspects i think dr anuj has brought in uh, very nicely but then there are caveats where we do not have acts like in transplant we have act of course there are certain loopholes in that as well but then having an act uh, as far as the palliative care is concerned because the number of patients is going to increase the number of situations is going to increase so having an act in a legal manner uh, anuj has projected so many uh, you know i mean forms and all these things which probably are from icmr but then uh, having uh, it from the government of india which is stable by the parliament i think that will be more supportive for us in the future days to come because this percentage of patients is definitely going to increase for us and as far as i understand the smb and pmb and all are probably from ethical perspective like you have the treating physicians you have the family on board and take a decision ethically whether you are going in a right lane or not but legally i think we need to have an act that's my comment sorry to interrupt i know Saivani, you are completely mm -hmm. disappointed by me interrupting you, <laughs> but I think I'm extremely glad for this. Uh, uh, John, I'm taking over. I'm yes, sure John yes, is also eagerly waiting. So thank you, thank you so much. I think we have just touched tip, 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 micro tip of an iceberg. I think there's lots for us to learn in the future days. So we will plan to have future more sessions with I. I now we know the. the experts in the fields of course there was a question one question if any of you the panelists can take children is as an vulnerable group in children if you want initiate you know dialysis uh from, even, even, if, even if the parents want to stop the therapy want to continue therapy that's a very delicate situation how do you look at that that's the only question which i'm going to ask any of the panelists can take nandini is there anuja and uh, anybody can take the question yeah how do you want to deal with the children who are needing an eskt treatment uh, you know i mean uh, should we continue should we not continue in a situation where the transplant may not be an, uh, a prospect for them 
Okay, I don't see the answers coming up. Okay, probably that's a gray area. We can try to deal with that later. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a lively and lovely session. And of course, I should thank uh, Lata Kumar Swamiji who has been and Kaushalya who have been uh, supporting us and who have given us a directive that there should be a webinar with the naive organization that is the Win India. And we, we are very glad we have chosen a very pertinent topic. Of course, Shruti was and Divya were the ones who have driven this topic into the present scenario. So thank you, the speakers, uh, Nandini Vallad and Anuja and Mary Ann, and of course, our sweet Jyoti Priya. So thank you so much. And thank you for your uh, uh, lauding, laudable presentation and the recording will be available shortly. We will try to share the recording. We generally load it in our Win India YouTube channel. We will share the recording with you and thank you so much. Looking forward to see you further in our future events. Thank you. Thank you, the technical team. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, the panelists and everyone. Thank you so much. Grateful. Thanks. For Have a great day. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so all much. of us. Thank you. Thank you. Joined late, but I didn't miss the whole. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. For 5K, WK, we are so grateful to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.